Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl, your host, as always. Today, we're joined by Popo Mintsue, a trailblazing VP of engineering at 99.co and a passionate advocate for women in tech as the partnership lead at Women in AI. With a rich background in the internet industry, Popo is a mastermind in mobile applications, Java, and Android development. Her academic foundation is rooted in a Bachelor of Engineering from Technological in University Mandalay, specializing in information technology. Poe's journey has seen her lead mobile engineering teams at both Shield, a global enterprise cyber protection company, and 99 Group. Her dedication to innovation and excellence is evident in her work, making her a standout figure in the tech world. I've asked her to join us here today to share her story and help us all prepare for the future tech developments that are coming. So Poe, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? I'm good. Yeah, yeah. this is a typical Wednesday. Yeah, thank you for being here. I'm actually very excited for this call. Now, before we get into kind of the, the current world of tech and where things are going, why are you such a techie? Are your parents really into tech as well? Is this, would you, you all sit around the family table at dinner time and, and code together or what? Actually, no, I'm the only one in the family. My parents, of course, my mom is a typical housewife. And then my dad is a, a language teacher. He taught like English speaking for his whole life. And then all of my sister also the same. They become a, a language teacher as well. But my brother is a chef in Myanmar. So it's a, we also, we are from like a small town from, from Myanmar. So not a lot of people are like techie or something like that. Right. And not a lot of opportunity there as well for tech. Yeah. So how did you get into this? And uh, actually, yeah. So initially I was also planning to follow my father's footsteps as well. Then since I'm studying the information technology, I'm interested in tech as well and the software development. So when, after my university, I started learning online for, uh, yeah for software development, mostly in mobile, because at the time I just got my first phone and I'm curious how the app are developed. So I just started learning online. Yeah, that's how I started. Got it. And so that's how you got started. And then how did you, your skills, because obviously there's skills that are that have to develop here, right? You don't just wake up overnight mm -hmm. and become a VP of engineering. There's clearly a process and a track record. Yes. So what were some of your early experiences? Yeah, I just do online learning and then I first built, I built my first app, which is a hit as well, because at the time in Myanmar, the internet, is, the mobile internet just started is around like 2012. Initially, we need to go to internet cafe to use the internet. Right. Then the, then a uh, mobile phone, you can use the uh, data on your phone and then you can have access to the internet, but they are not charged by the megabyte or like data you use at the time, because in Myanmar, they charge you by the minute you are using. So Whoa. it's why, right? So like in most countries, you will have a like, a, yeah, to charge your data usage and then they will charge you. So what I do as my first app is, I have a internet usage timer. The app will track how many minutes you use and then calculate the price for you. Ooh, I love so, that. Yeah, so that was a hit because in the market, there is nowhere this kind of app, and it's also unique to our country. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. So you found a need, you designed an app, launched it, and it was a hit. Yes. So that's how I started. How my, uh, I designed my first app. Of course, second app is also the something related to family. It's like I created a, like a English learning app as well. Mm. So. Yeah. So all I like, I'm just studying my own. I don't have, I have a side job as a teaching and I'm doing this as a hobby. Then how I get into it, like since in Myanmar also at the time, not a lot of people are at the global. So I stand out. I stood mm -hmm. up for sure. Then a company in the Yangon, which is in Myanmar, it's like a, it's like a tech center because every company in tech will be there. And in my city, there's not much opportunity. So a, a guy from that company in Yangon contacted me, Hey, are you interested in like applying job at our company? So he mm -hmm. recruited me 
then I was, yeah, I, I got my first job there. That's fantastic. Uh, you stand out for your skills and also I think being a woman in the field too, right? There's not as many women either. So you have such yes. a unique perspective that you bring to it, I think as well, just as a different gender. Men, when you get a bunch of men in the room, they're all going to think the same way. Yes. And I think that's super powerful and interesting as well. Yeah. So most of the time, yes. Yeah. In, in that company, it's also, I'm enough. Yeah. Only one, two women there, including me. Yeah. So. Yeah. So then what, you start working for this company and what do they have you working on? Uh, we were working on the, like, a, a, a app, anonymous app, like that you can vent, like a social media app, but your, your uh, identity is anonymous, of course. So that's what I was working on that company. But unfortunately, I only worked for six months there. Then I decided to move to Singapore and apply a job in Singapore. Yeah, I don't know if that was unfortunate. I think that was a smart move. <laughs> yeah, my boss will be, will be unfortunate for my boss. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> so then you had to move to a whole new country. And what was that like? Culturally, it's different. The language, I know Singapore uses English, but it's not. They use English, but they also speak, is it Mandarin or Cantonese? I've been to Singapore a couple of times. And I think mostly they speak in English and a little bit of like Singlish, they call it because yeah. it's a mix of Malay. Cantonese and Hokkien. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So for you coming there, was it tough culturally to come there and start working? Yeah. It's a bit hard because, okay, I know that my family come from the like English speaking, like teacher background, but we don't normally used to talk every day in English. And then the accent are different in Singapore as well because they have a mix of Indian, yeah. Malay, like Chinese, and all their accents are different. Yeah. And Sometimes it's also hard to think foreign tend to speak English very fast as well. So the first year is a bit rough, even like ordering food at the food court. <laughs> yeah. So that is a bit of adjustment. I get, I can empathize with you. I, I lived in Japan for two years and I was so naive when I left. I had no idea what I was walking into. I remember my friend was dropped. We, we stopped a couple of months in Vancouver. Like we did a layover. We had to fly from Toronto, Vancouver to Tokyo. And I, I wanted to go visit all my friends because I lived in BC for a couple of years. So we actually took a couple of months as a layover. And then my friend dropped me off at the airport. And I remember he was like, sayonara. And I was like, oh, right, that's Japanese, right? As I get on, as I'm going to the airport to fly, I had no idea. So you talk about like ordering food and that. Yeah, yeah. Like a lot of memories there. Okay. So what would you recommend to someone who's starting and maybe starting out and struggling? They're just trying to get like work in a new culture. They've moved to a new country. They're trying to find work and survive. Do you have any tips for anyone that might be in that scenario? I think it's, it's good to adapt quickly as much as you can and learn their culture and go out with them. And yeah, so it, it will be like, otherwise in a new country, if you don't have any friends, you will be lonely, right? So you need to make friends at work and also like outside of work as well. Uh, go to activity like, like hobby or something like that. And then it will be much quicker to ad adapt as well to the culture. Yeah, that's, those are great tips. Those are great tips. So then is that how you ended up working at the company right now? Or did you start somewhere else first? Yeah, I started at 99.co. Yeah. So I started as a junior Android engineer, of course. Then I, I yeah, I walked my way up. Which is commendable. First off, you've immigrated to Singapore. You had to teach yourself how to code and everything. Then you get a job and write writing apps and you work your way up all the way to now being VP or the VP of yeah. engineering. So what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced in developing the skills needed to grow to that role? And then the hardest part is communication, articulating what you want to say, and also putting yourself out there. This is, it's hard for the culture of, I know that Singapore is not different in culture because we are all Asian, but still Singapore is already a developed country, right? And I come from somewhere, not from a tech world and not from an educator in terms of a lot of people yep. surrounding me. So yep. it's hard. Yeah. A lot of struggle in terms of like articulating myself so that mm -hmm. they understand me. And also another thing is putting myself out there. So mostly we were, we told in our school that, hey, just shut up and learn. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> how the culture is, right? Just shut up and learn. Okay. 
Yeah, don't question us or something like that. We are not encouraged to ask questions and all that. So need to struggle like how to be present in meetings, how to ask the right question and don't overthink about is it stupid I'm asking this or all these. So these are hard. Yeah. So now I want to ask you, I'll kind of pivot to some tech talk here because you've been obviously developing a lot of technology really on the cutting edge in a lot of ways. First, can we talk about security a bit with your experience in cybersecurity? This is something that a lot of people, especially like a business owner, they don't even necessarily know what they need to be prepared for, right? Mm -hmm. What are some of the biggest yeah. concerns for maybe the everyday person or even just an every, like the everyday small business owner when it comes to cybersecurity? Yeah. Okay. The most I interest in is the data and privacy, of course, because right now the AI and generated AI is a hit as well. Mostly, I think as the end user, people don't care much about what the data, the business or app are collecting. Of course, there's are some reason that some businesses are collecting a lot of your data, but you might not be aware of it or you don't care. But actually, we should care because these are these data they are using it for the further develop. They are maybe like for good, and also some are also using this to profit. As, as well. Okay. So what are some of the things that people should try? Are there any simple steps that people can follow to try to protect yeah. themselves? I think in the recent year, especially for app development, Google and Apple are quite strict about the collecting user data without the user consent, of course. But even that there's a uh, user should be aware of the app they are using, what they are giving them as a data. Like you can go and check on the, the, the app you're using, the privacy setting and also the data collection terms and agreement all these mostly people will just click agree right and then they will just give the data and they don't know what they are giving as well and some sometimes it's a fall for scam as well it's like you they will ask you to install an app or something like that and then you will give like all this permission and later people will complain that hey my bank account is hacked or something like that right. because they install an app and then the app is watching every key stored, your screen, the text messages, all these. Then they will be surprised that, oh, I just installed the app and why this happened? Because you don't check the permission you are giving to an app. Got it. So we talked about cybersecurity mm -hmm. and now we've had some major developments of things like AI and, you know, there's things like Copilot and that. What do you think are some of the biggest opportunities for business owners out there right now? Yeah, this is quite interesting because in my workplace as well, we are trying to, how say, leverage AI in our day-to-day -day as well. But of course, more, more like co-pilot or something like, because, okay, for the tech world, tech repo or whatever we are developing, we might have a sign of the legacy code or legacy dependency, but we don't have time to work on yet. But generated AI that come in play is like they can uh, create, refactor our code, like in some, if right now is they cannot do like very complicated work for sure, but they can do like a minor changes. So it's, it's helpful that is since we don't have time, we can let the, like this kind of generated AI code to automatically update our legacy code, like in terms of ah. updating our library and all that. So right. it, it saves our engineer time. Got it. That is a huge, that is a huge advantage. So it can't necessarily create, you can't say, make me an app that will do this. Yeah. I couldn't yes. say, make me an app that will track my inner internet usage, time usage and the cost. You couldn't yeah. just say that and have it produce a final product, but you could say, Hey, this code is from 20, whatever, 15, it's outdated. Please yeah. update to meet these standards. Is that be, is that fair? Yeah, so it's like these kind of tools out there, they scan your code base and then they make their own adjustment and pull, send a pull request to for you to approve whether this is correct or not. Like uh, maybe like you're using a Facebook SDK or something like that, it's outdated, they will update for you. Now, if somebody wanted to try, like whether there's a, let's say there's a dry cleaner and they want to try to start being more, you know, digitally savvy, what would you recommend to them in terms of starting out? What platforms or code, like what language, is it as hard as people think it is? Or what are some basic steps people could use to try to get into this game? Now, I know that a lot of people are saying that if you've got a website, 
but you can turn it into an app, you will get a 30% bump in everything, traffic, engagement, usage, because of the app nature and I'm versus having to go to a website and it's fewer steps. It's, it's in their phone versus somewhere else. So for someone that's trying to stay current and on top of things, what would you recommend if someone was just coming along now and okay, I need to jump in on this for my business. I need to get into having apps and being more mobile friendly. What do you recommend? I think as a small business owner, I wouldn't recommend like building an app because it will be a lot undertaking as well, but you can make your website more mobile friendly, or you can make a web app. So what they can do is they can just have a, like a, it's like a app, but in web package. So you go to your website and then you put a shortcut on your iPhone or something like that. It behaves like an app as well. So that it will save you money to just hire like an app developer or something like that. Of course, but if you need a, like a specific, you need an app for, you really need an app. Then you could go for like a Flutter app, which is you can, it can work both Android and iOS. So it's a cross platform and it will save money mostly for the startup business that they don't need to hire two engineers. They can work with one engineer for one platform only, right? So this kind of thing. You said it was, it was a Flutter app. Is that what you said? Or a floater? Flutter. Flutter. F-L-U-T-T, yeah. Yeah. yeah Flutter. Okay. Okay. A Flutter app. That's very interesting. Okay. Got it. And so you're all saying you don't necessarily need an app. If you just help people bookmark it and save it on their home screen, that it'll still. Yes. And so their emphasis should just be on making your site really mobile friendly, making sure you use yes. a mobile responsive theme, make sure the page load speed fine is good. And even being considerate of the navigation, the difference in navigation, making sure that things aren't buried bottom where you got to scroll 17 times because yeah. mobile what well, on a desktop, a small scroll can be like four or five scrolls, right? On a mobile. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's just a, it depends on like the kind of business you are going, let's say you say dry cleaning. What I would say is maybe like you app, you are like a social media game and then creating a chatbot on the social media platform to book or something like that will be better for your business instead of building your own website or or even like creating an app, right? So it depends on the type of business you are running. You can think of whether you need to build a website on your own or maybe like a, just a social media will be fine or something like that. And can you maybe speak to the engineering process from brainstorming and researching to prototyping to final to pushing product? Can you speak to that process a little bit? For again, a business owner, maybe they're really good at doing what they do. They could, mm-hmm. maybe they own a restaurant. But now they're trying to, okay, because of the pandemic, a lot of people realize that they need a digital presence. And so now they have to get into creating digital assets of various sorts, whether it's a content marketing plan, maybe it is a website they need to develop. Maybe they need some sort of lead management CRM system, right? But all that follows an engineering process, I think. And so can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. So I think the, what you're mentioning is like end-to-end, right? As a business owner, what you want is an end product and you have some goal as well. Like maybe like you want to have an engagement or you want to have a better like a management system for your lead or something like that. So before that is, okay, since we take one route or like we have a high-level roadmap or something like that, the end goal, then we'll think of a high-level roadmap. And also after that is like, you will think about like use cases. What are the use cases? Why the user should use this app? Mm-hmm. Or what, what is the user story? So this kind of thing will be like a, become a requirement based on the user story and the use cases. And mostly for our for us, it's like we have, of course, a product manager and then the business analyst to do all this come up with like use cases based on the user requirement. And then this become a product requirement. Mm. So then the engineering process kick in for the engineer is like, we assess their product requirement. What does broad product want to achieve? And then we try to apply some of the engineering solution and just dis- a discussion going on in terms of like how to architecture for these use cases and what are the best tools for us to use? What is the most feasible? What is the least feasible way? Like pros and cons, we need to debate all these. And then we once we finalize that with the business that this is the requirement they want and this is what we are going to provide, then we will start our uh, development cycle. Yeah. 
So we go into the uh, D-Day creation of each requirement, transform that into a task, and then engineer will pick up on that and then work on like each task. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, then mm. the, after the like a development is done, there will be like a QA process, the quality assurance process will kick in. And then after that, everything is fine. Then we have like test case check and then everything past that, it will go to the production. But of course, there will be always a loop if you need to refine your product, fix your bag and all that. So this is like a endless, I guess. Yeah. So I think that's really helpful. If I understand properly, what I love is that you talked about it really starts off with the use cases and the user story. So everything begins yeah. with the end user in mind. And a lot of business owners don't do this. They, I want to open up a restaurant and they just pick a location and open the restaurant, but they haven't identified who's going to be coming and eating my food and where are they? Yes. How far will they have to travel to come to my store? There's not that, but you're talking about that is the very foundation that all this is built on. Yes. So all the business that uh, need to build on, upon the, the paying customer, right? What they want right. and what we can give. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I love that. Now, so we've talked a bit about, first off, your journey, getting established. I, I think even your advice about getting established in a new country, it would even apply for someone that's starting a new industry or if they have to have a new career. That going out, yeah. learning the act, going to activities, uh, making friends, getting into getting involved in the community. And then from that, you talked about, we talked a bit about cybersecurity and how to protect ourselves. That's really important because that can be a huge setback. A lot of times the, the people to get derailed and frustrated because of early mistakes and often newbie mistakes that they could avoid easily. For example, I didn't keep my seed code protected once when I first got into crypto. Now, luckily I didn't lose a lot, but I, I learned that lesson Yeah, and that's, and things like that. Those are simple mistakes where that's just, anybody would be like, duh, idiot, keep your seed phrases protected. But for me as a newbie, I just didn't realize. And I think that sets a lot of people back. So we've covered some of those early steps. We talked about the engineering process. Can you talk a little bit about where you think things are going? If we fast forward five, 10, 15 years, what trends do people need to be aware of? What do you think will, will have happened or changed? Hmm. Yeah, I know in terms of technology, we are advancing quite really quick. So mostly it's last year, like I think the chat GPT came out and it's blow everyone mind, especially of yeah. course, even from tech people like me, it can blow my mind. Right. No, then the, there's are like a user who are not tech savvy at all. They will be also like quite impressed as well. Because previously, like I have a flatmate, then she's okay. She come back from work, work one day and then she's like, hey, I have this website called ChatGPT and then it can answer like all my questions and like that. Why you didn't tell me before? Oh, I thought you are not interested in what I am doing. Right. But actually, yeah, it was like, uh, yeah, even like uh, day to day who is not involved with that uh, quite literally taken with the, uh, the generated AI. So, so yeah. yeah. No, please keep continue. Yeah. So my assumption in the next five years or something will be like, uh, mostly AI will be dominated. Uh, of course, this uh, like a uh, large language model and what we can do with it. And these are the like uh, forefront. And of course, like also previously, I talked about like data and privacy, right? And people will be more, since the AI will be developed further, people are now like debating about whether your data should be trained for the large language model or something like that. And users should be aware of what data, whether their data are trained for the, this kind of like AI thing or not. Yeah. So these are like where we're going. So I will assume that in the future, there will be like a, a way to protect your data and also for the stay, we are going on in the right direction. So this is something is called, there's something called federated learning. Oh, what? So federated learning. Yeah. So it's also with the large language model as well. your data will be protected. Let's say you are using the, let's say large language model for the AI or something. They were, they were not. So how it works is mostly your data was sent to the server, then the server will train on your data, right? But the, what, how federated learning work is like, you have your data on your device and then they train the data on device, just a portion, and then update the result. 
to the server. So it's not like sending your data to the server, instead more like train on your device and set only the reset to the server. Ah. So that way you can have your data uh, protected to yourself, but stay, you are contributing to the reset, contributing the reset, this kind of thing. So th I, I hope that this is more like where we are going. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Me too, me too. Because a lot of people don't may understand like, oh, I don't have anything to hide, but even if you have nothing for hide, yeah. to hide, nefarious actors may use your data for bad. Already right now, at least in the, I know in Canada and the US, senior citizens are often attacked by phishing scams to try and get their banking info yeah. on that because there's, there's yes. bad actors out there. And if so, if it's publicly available, how old you are and your contact info and even what bank that you may bank with, and it might just be because on Facebook, you liked your bank's Facebook page. That's all you have to do. You go on Facebook, you like it, but that data is public. Bad actors can maybe start sorting through that data and look for people that like this bank that are in this age bracket and then go track down your contact info and call and pretend that they're from your bank, giving you a call. And an innocent old lady that's not expecting anything answers a couple of questions. They now use that to bypass the security questions when they call your actual bank. And they empty yeah. your bank accounts, right? So this is an example of where just because people feel that they have nothing to hide, it doesn't mean you don't need to protect yourself and be aware. I, I think yeah. this is, I, I read a study that I found very fascinating. I don't remember, I was younger when I read it. I think maybe it was Queens University, my hometown that did it, but it may have been a different university. It was a study on squirrels. And they found, so squirrels bury nuts and then leave and come back and get the nuts and later and eat it. And they found that if a squirrel had stolen buried nuts from another squirrel when the thief was burying a nut if it saw squirrels seeing it bury the nut it would leave wait for that squirrel to leave and then come back and move its its nut meaning that it would anticipate that squirrel might steal my food just like i did that other squirrel but squirrels that had never stolen food didn't care if people saw them bury food because they couldn't imagine stealing someone's food. And this is yeah. the idea like I could talk about just because someone may not be an evil person or a bad character, you may not be aware of how evil some other people might be just because you're a good person. And so yes. I think that's like what you're saying here. Now, walking into this unknown and unknowable future, what specific skills or behaviors do you believe are important for your staff, your team? to improve or develop, to be prepared? Yeah. I think mostly it's, I would say it's like for the junior engineer, it's like your mastery on your test case is important. But once you climb the ladder or once you advance your career, what more important is how to present yourself and more likely your soft skill become starting to matter because you might need to manage multiple stakeholder. You need to manage your, you need to manage your junior. You need to manage you need to, to communicate with your stakeholder, like maybe like your lead or your CEO or whoever. So then it come into to play is like how you present yourself and how you can articulate all these that soft skill become matters, like decision making. Uh, yeah. So this kind of thing. That's good. That's a good tip. That's good advice. So this has been a really informative call. Do you, what do you feel was ever holding you back? Do you feel that something held you back and then you figured it out and that's part of why you became VP of engineering? Yeah. Was it, was it something I, that you learned? And then mostly it's like, what set me back is that like I also have, most people have an imposter syndrome. And mm -hmm. sometimes I feel like, is this the right thing I'm doing? Or maybe I'm pretentious or whatever. But I think that is normal for people to feel as well because like you sometimes get unsure. And it's also more for me is because of my background and where I was, of course. But at the end of the day, I feel like, okay, I need to put myself out there and uh, I, I need to be like, uh, be confident on what I know and speak up instead of thinking like overthinking, hey, this might be the wrong thing to say or something like that. Yeah, fair enough. I think you've come a long way. I think you've done a lot. Can you just speak for a minute about women? You talk about leader, leading women in AI. As a man, I'm mm -hmm. very unaware of what's going on in that respect. What are some of the key themes or topics that maybe would be mm. important to talk about? Yeah. So mostly 
we there's a like multiple organization that like support women in technology or women in like various fields. So mostly women in AI is founded just for the to have more diversity in the AI world. Mm. Yeah. So what we do is we have a, we have workshop and training program for to get more women involved in the AI field. Mm. Yeah. That's yes. Important. So the thing is, you want more diversity in the the developing the yeah. AI because there's a lot of bias and mostly these all these like. In today, even today, like a lot of things are like man focused and in your team, you might not have a, like a, maybe most of the time in like tech team, even in my team, a lot of men. So if then the, the data might be you are collecting or the, the way you are developing the technology might have bias too. So what you want is you want more people from various backgrounds, not just women, like people of color or all yeah. these developing together. So it's, it has less bias and fair technology. Yeah. I love that. I love that a lot. I think that's really true. I learned that in some of the research that we did on business success. I learned that there were such a thing as leading questions that if you come up with a survey to try to measure something, you actually have to validate your survey first because you may be asking leading questions or even culturally biased questions. And a simple example yeah. is if you ask someone, hey, do you know this show? And people don't know that show. Like in one country, like in Canada, Simpsons was really popular when I was a kid. But not everybody watched The Simpsons. So if I asked a question and made reference, that would be a culturally biased question because other people may not know that. And there's new little nuanced ways that we can do that. There was a documentary I saw too about um, AI being biased towards Asian and Caucasians because a lot of the developers were Asian and Caucasian. And so when they were training them for like facial recognition, those facial recognition tools were being trained on data sets of Caucasian and Asian people. And so there was an underrepresentation of different types of people. Yeah. That's a really important thing. I'm glad you brought that up, that diversity is stability. And as much as sometimes we may get frustrated dealing with people that are not like us, we really need that. We are part of an ecosystem and we need everybody. Yeah. Here. Yeah. hundred percent. A hundred percent. Well, this has been such a good interview. I've got a couple mm -hmm. of pieces of notes. Is there anything sure. I haven't asked you that I should have asked you? I think we have covered a, a, a wide range of questions and yeah, me too. Should be good. Yeah. If people want to reach out, if they want to learn more, if they want to get touch and get in touch with you, what are some of the best ways for them to reach out? Sure. They can reach out to me from LinkedIn okay. uh, with my name, of course. Hope okay. okay. So those that want to get in touch, P-O-E-P-O-E-M-Y-I-N-T-S-W-E. -E -E. That's Popo Mint Sway. Mm -hmm. And you can find her on LinkedIn. You know you've got the right one if she's the VP of engineering at 99.co and partnership lead at Women in AI Singapore. Popo, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a very useful and insightful call. I really appreciate you sharing with us knowing that you have your own direct reports, your own community, your own following of people to take care of. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. This is really a cutting. It's an honor to be here, Esther. Thank mm -hmm. you.